in 1996, when I wrote Rain Without Thunder, I introduced this idea of new welfareism, that the difference between the old welfareists and the new welfareists was that the new welfareists believed that welfare regulation um, would and should get to uh, the abolition of exploitation in the long term. There is no empirical reason to believe that the regulation of animal exploitation will ever lead to its abolition. Uh, abolition. There's no historical evidence for that. If anything, there is quite a bit of historical evidence that the more regulation we have, the more animal exploitation we have, because people end up feeling better about exploitation the more you regulate it, because they think it's okay, it's humane, it's it's acceptable, it's morally acceptable. Many of the practices that these welfareists attack are pra practices that are already economically vulnerable. For example, the gestation crate with pigs, with sows. Um, Animal, animal agriculture studies show that if you give, if you use an electronic, electronic sow feeding system as an alternative to these gestation crates, you increase sow productivity. You cut down on mortality. You cut down on disease. So a lot of these these campaigns that um, that that are that are the target of animal welfare people, uh, animal welfare groups like PETA, HSUS, etc., um, just about all of them, um, are are practices that are, are are economically vulnerable. Now, one might ask legitimately, well, wait a minute, if they're economically not viable, why does an industry shift without being told by the animal people to shift? Because if they're rational actors, wouldn't they, they do what was economically efficient? And the answer is, it's more complicated than that. When factory farming was developing, the people who were designing this, they weren't factoring in that we're not dealing with widgets, we're dealing with sentient beings that get stressed and get ill as a result of that stress. So people weren't really thinking about, you know, they were thinking about concentration, you know, concentrating commodities and, and increasing profits. They weren't thinking about, and they weren't factoring in what the costs were gonna be of that, of that intense concentration. And what's coming out now is, you know, is, is indications that certain aspects of factory farming are very economically inefficient. But it takes time for that information to get out, for that information to become internalized within the industry, and for capital costs to be incurred to change those practices. Industries like the meat industry or, or biomedical research for that matter um, will resist any sort of, of uh, regulation even if they don't think it's particularly harmful because they always need to impose opportunity costs on opponents or adversaries because they want to make sure that everybody understands if you come after us, if you want us to change something, it's gonna, we're going to exact our pound of flesh from you. I remember having a conversation with some vivisectors at the University of Pennsylvania where I was then teaching and I said, you know, why are you guys opposing the, animal, the 1985 amendments to the Animal Welfare Act. They're not going to hurt you. If anything, they're going to help you. And they said, yeah, we know it's going to, you know, but we've got to oppose it because if we don't oppose it, if we're not seen to oppose it, uh, then you might come after us on something we really don't like. What's happened is that the animal movement has become, you know, there's this bizarre partnership between animal industries and animal organizations where animal organizations are going after these animal, you know, after industries for largely, you know, uh, minor changes. They go through this dance, they yell and scream at each other, and then there's some accommodation, which doesn't require that industry do very much. The animal people then declare victory and send around 80,000 million pieces of direct mail and ask, you know, tell people, you know, you can help change the world, just write us your check. And, and they make lots of money. I was just looking at some of the emails I got today, and, and the, the consistent theme in so many of these, these, uh, the, the, these, these uh, uh, things that I'm reading is various animal welfare reforms are being disregarded. I mean, you know, whether it's, whether it's you know, there's now a move to start ho horse slaughter again. Uh, you know, I have all these activists in Britain who, uh, who, who, who uh, 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 advocated against the use of uh, dogs and fox hunting and stuff. The, the bans being disregarded. I mean, it's like all these welfare things, None of them ever really works because we haven't changed the way people think. And as long as we don't change the way people think, it's never, I mean, you're never going to see any sustained change. But that, that paradigm shift has got to center on and focus on what people eat as long as 99% of us think it's all right to eat animal products with the best justification we have for inflicting pain, suffering, and death on 56 billion animals every year, not including aquatic animals, is that they taste good. Well, as long as you've got most of us thinking that, nothing's ever going to change. I was saying in the 1980s, 
what we ought to be doing is coming up with creative, nonviolent ways of educating people about veganism so that we can shift the paradigm away from the property status of animals, because that was also clear to me as a lawyer, as a law professor, it was clear to me that animals are economic commodities as long as they're, as long, you know, I mean, as long as we have this relationship of property to property owners, as long as animals were economic commodities, every time you try to protect animal interests, you were paying money. What that's going to do is it's going to severely limit the sort of protection that we accord animals. And that's why animal welfare doesn't work because it's bas it basically, we can't afford to protect animal interests, protect, particularly in the world that we live in now with the fact that we have all of these trade barriers down, we have this quote free trade situation. It's never gonna work. If we really wanna change the world, it's got, we've got to focus on veganism.